Welcome everyone to another edition of Art Design and Conversations. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to um, uh, introduce our guest here today, uh, Premji Shachari, a very close personal friend and somebody who is who's just making waves in the art world today, but we'll get to that. Um, I will uh, start off today's session with our usual kind of a quick introduction of what Beans is all about, why why we are here and why we're having this conversation. Beans was started in uh, last year in February 2022 on a very auspicious date, 2202-2022, quirky. Um, it's a design studio, we're a design studio that's based out of Bhubaneshwar that creates elegant, ethnically inspired and environmentally friendly products. I mean, those are our value systems. Our vision is to inspire lives with inspiring design from Odisha. We firmly believe that the creative spirit of Odisha has a lot to give to the world and has been undertapped, which we hope to correct by bringing in uh, thoughtful designs that uh, uh, reflect this uh, untapped creative spirit. Um, we believe in the power of art and design to make people's lives better. All our products are handmade, uh, they're very contemporary in nature. They, um, uh, and uh, we have a value system of eco-consciousness which we bring in with very strict standards in zero plastic packaging and using materials that we hope would um, contribute to our sustainability aims across, uh, um, across all our work. So that's a little bit about us, Beads. We are mentored by um, with a very renowned sculptor, uh, Jagannath Panda. So he, uh, he's he been the inspiration behind this. So uh, under his watchful eyes, new products and new items are coming through that you can see on the screen. Uh, the ones that you see on the screen are inspired by the tribal heritage of Orissa, especially from the South Orissa Hills. So um, that's a little bit about us. Um, if I move on quickly and give a quick description of why we're doing our design conversations, we are a product design studio and we are looking products. But the reason to uh, conduct this series is because we are also very curious about understanding the influences that are driving today's contemporary uh, art movements and product design and um, what we'll talk about today, which is the resurgence of uh, interest in craftsmanship. Um, so art design and conversation series lies uh, uh, like means an attempt to explore the methodologies and motivations underlying indigenous craftsmanship. We want to commence dialogues with accomplished professionals from different worlds of art and design. We've had some wonderful guests in the past. Um, and these dialogues will seek to unravel the ecological and communal consequences associated with our current fascination with mass manufactured goods. Uh, and then underscore the importance and pertinence of native artisanal traditions and um, highlight the transformative role of mediums such as ceramics in which we are working today and there's so many other great mediums that we'll be hopefully exploring in the, in the future um, that are reshaping our contemporary perceptions of our uh, craftsmanship. So that's the reason we're doing it. It's not just about making product, it's also about understanding uh, diverse influences on product design and why why we should be considering handmade goods and crops in a in a much more serious manner. So uh, these conversations definitely help us in uh, in our design process and our choice of mediums to work with. And uh, um, today we uh, are having a very interesting topic, which is related to that. The topic that we are exploring today is artisanal resurgence. Um, and the reason this topic was chosen is that everywhere today there is a great interest in the world of uh, the handmade, the, the craftsmen. And uh, that's having a direct impact on a lot of the lifestyle choices that people are making in terms of what kind of goods they want to put in their houses, in their living spaces, in their lives. And uh, that, that also impacts the makers significantly and the choices they're making in producing goods. So we will attempt to unravel some of these complexities and kind of look at future paths on uh, contemporary making and um, and the impact and the resurgence of artisanal craftsmanship and the interest in it. And no better person to do that than Premjeshachari. And um, 
Just a quick bio, uh, because a bio is always good, but I'd, I'd rather hear straight from Premjit about his journey in the world of art curation and history. Uh, but a quick bio on him is uh, Premjit is a curator and writer based in Delhi. He teaches art history and theory at Shivnath University. Um, he founded the in-depth curatorial platform called Future Collaborations, which aims at uh, theoretically and politically informed curation. Um, I know him personally, and all of us, you know, I know him personally from uh, his days of a co-curator of the Bhuvneshwar Art Trail 2018, which is one of the largest public arts festivals in India. He's curated numerous projects in the context of India, the UK, and the US. The recipient of the Inlax Take on Art Travel Grant for Young Critics in 2016, was a fellow for Curatorial Intensive South Asia, CISA in 2017 at Koj. Uh, in 2018, he's received the Art Scribes Award from the Pramaya Art Foundation for developing new curatorial paradigms. Um, as, as a result of this award, he was a resident um, at Chateau de la Poule in, uh, in France. And he's also the winner of the Art Writers Award 2021 issued by the Swiss, Swiss Arts Council, uh, Pro Helvetia. So very distinguished gentleman indeed. And welcome, Prangish, to this talk. And thank you so much for taking your time out today to uh, join us on this. Without much further ado, how did you get into this world of art curation, become an art historian and such a um, uh, such an amazing art writer? And tell us a little bit about the whole personalized field. What makes you tick in all of these areas? Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sandeep, first of all. And thanks to Bragya and all the other team members of Beach. A very beautiful name, which is related to the joining of each individual bead, turning into something really beautiful, which philosophically and aesthetically, if you look at it, implies on the individuality of one bead, but also what it can do when it all is joined together and creates also something very unique and interesting. It's a beautiful name and also um, beautiful endeavor. Uh, I remember, I think last year we had a discussion about beads. You had, we had a long call when we had started. And even in today's discussion, some of those concerns, I think we, we, we can raise some of those concerns, especially in terms of craft. Uh, and also the various nomenclature we denote for this form of practice, which we call as craft, art, or craft, or whatever. What, uh, but it's a very important decision to have at this stage. And why it is important, I will tell you very shortly. Uh, but before that, I can see a lot of familiar names. Sarveshwar, Rajesh, and all those guys that here. And happy to see you. And Malaysia is like uh, a home for me. And I've stayed there for a long time. And I've been at Sukhanya also since here. So it's good to see all of you here. And the points that we have come together. Uh, for this event. Uh, and we, we we did something lovely in Bhuvneshwar, something really back from the community level. And I hope to sustain that and continue that in the coming times also. Uh, I don't want to get into a biological kind of what you call mapping of what I did. I want to relate my journey with also the larger journey of Indian art. Because what I did was also uh, in response as a critique to what was happening in the curatorial practice of Indian art uh, at a particular time. And and what I started as future collaborations was a response to that, was a critique of that, and also was trying to define a new pathway of how exhibitions should be done and how artists and curators or all the participants who are involved in the art world should work together. So, uh, I studied in JNU, uh, the Arts and Aesthetics Department, and at, uh, while I was studying, a significant development which happened during that time was the, the art market boom that was part of the 2000s uh, uh, of contemporary art. The market collapsed and there was a significant depression in the art market of that particular time, there was a significant depression uh, in the art activities of that time. There was a scaling down that was going on. Uh, there was a correction that was happening in terms of pricing. There was a lot of withdrawal that was happening. 
And the recession hit, uh, especially the private art galleries and collections, very good. And a lot of artists who had exhibitions and all at that time, uh, who were selling really well, uh, who were uh, visible very well, uh, became, uh, right now when you look at all of them, you to really difficult to find them. Most of them are kind of withdrawn. They're not practicing anymore. It was a sad scenario, a very sad scenario when I entered into this practice of curation. And like many other curators, I also started curating in a very uh, similar manner, which is to find a theme, mm-hmm. a topic, and then kind of weave artworks around it. And that was a dominant practice of curation that was going on at that time, that you find a theme, fragility, vulnerability, rhythm, harm, and you may give beautiful names to it, and you ask artists to create some work, or you already have some works, and then you put it together. And there was there was a plethora, kind of a profusion of such kind of exhibitions that were going on in India at that time. And everybody was a curator, everybody was an art writer, and I'm not just saying that. I'm not saying that nobody can. You need some kind of special qualification to be a curator and all. Uh, what I think of as an eligibility to curate is to have a sensibility to the making of the exhibition. Right. And that was sick. So I also did a couple of such shows in Habitat and in Yalitella. And after that, I withdrew for three years. Because right. I realized that I want to do this. I don't want to continue doing this. Uh, and I went to do a mode of self-learning about curation. And this was also a significant period when uh, uh, a broad an important discussion was happening on how to make exhibitions as important sites of educational and non-political activities, but also important, uh, importantly to reflect on what the role of curate is. What is the uh, figure of curate? And to very briefly tell you, if you look at the word curator, it actually originates from the Latin word called curare, C-U-R-A-R-E. That's the etymology of the mm-hmm. term. So, um, um, in Spanish, in the Spanish, if you look at the term curator, also means physician, doctor, yeah. one who heals, one who takes care of. The curator also means one who take care of. Now, what does he take care? Of? She take care of. They take care of. They're taking care of really specially valued objects, which mm-hmm. the society thinks is important. Right, and that's the task of his curators historically. Whether it is museums, and then from museums to private galleries, private museums, and all, this task has remained the same for a long time. But then a significant change came when curators started addressing this issue that more than the objects that are valued by the culture, that they think that this is important for our heritage, curators started valuing and taking care of subjects who were not given importance. Such as marginal subjects. Mm-hmm. And this was an important shift in the curatorial practices. Right. The curators shifted from objects to such things. Mm-hmm. And the make, not only the makers, but the communities were vulnerable. Communities mm-hmm. were precarious. Communities were uh, what you call marginal to reach out to them. And also include expressions and practices which were not usually included in art practices. And such as right. and bright and all those forms of practice. Okay. And I will give you an example from my own journey. And the second reason why I also thought re uh, thought of reconfiguring curation was there was a significant alienation, what was a positive alienation? There was an alienation as a result of competition in content. Okay. Everybody was trapped into their own studios. There was such a great competitive spirit which kind of hindered the collaborative spirit of contemporary. Mm-hmm. The group of artists, ones who used to move together, who used to think together, who, who used to challenge the institution. So even if you look at the previous generation, the radicals, the progressives, the chola members, all those people, and even the critical communities, like uh, many people in the group of young mm-hmm. artists who used to hang around in Monday House and on for sleeper. Yep. slowly started drifting away and then got isolated into their own studios. Mm-hmm. And this was a result of the kind of obsession with market and selling on the competitive spirit was that was there. So my idea was to 
infuse a collaborative spirit in the way we work together, not only to create, but also to relate with each other. So if I can share a few slides quickly, yeah. just to that absolutely take a lot and show you that. So we started feature collaboration almost in like uh, 2015, 16, I started it, and then I started collaborating with other participants. And we were basically trying to renew curation, collaboration, exhibition, writing, and also taking away attention from the final exhibition, because for the curator, the final exhibition is the big thing. Rather than right. that, we were interested in uh, giving importance to the process, the every day that leads to the exhibition. Right. And that every day was important for us, and we activated the every day by doing different things on the every day, and every day, every day was important. We hosted a series of conversations. Uh, uh, we also did public performances in various parts of Delhi, responding to the various political situations of that particular time. So in right. metros, outside, in shopping malls, and different places in Delhi, Assam, and all these places. Uh, finding abandoned buildings, and also performing in them, recording them. Uh, so we did a lot of these activities, basically. And the idea was to again work together, work together, come together, and uh, kind of uh, not create collaboration as a juggle bandhi. Usually that's what like, yeah. collaboration is to that. That a writer comes and an artist comes and artists illustrate for the writer. And right. that's not the idea of collaboration which I had. My idea was that if a writer and artist come together, they should organically develop something that is part and of their own group, but also something that evolves in them when they come together. Yeah. yeah. So this is the idea of collaboration. Yeah, and I think the points that you're making around uh, the uh, the focus on process and collaboration rather than that one capstone event that everyone comes and claps and says, oh, this is a wonderful exhibition, it's a beautiful curation, and then walks away, uh, somehow diminishes uh, the process of making, the process, the pain, and uh, the conversations, the philosophies that influence the bringing together of such an exhibition. I think a curatorial um, focus on that, like you were just talking about, is just so fundamentally important. Because otherwise, I think it reduces it to the lowest common denominator of people gathering and looking at objects, which I think is a great point we just made. Yes. So, this was the beginning and this was the shift. Uh, uh, and then, this was the journey where I got involved into many exhibitions and all. And again, a significant shift that has happened in my curatorial practice for the last few years is uh, taking on research questions and then turning them into exhibitions. Right. Which was yeah. important topic. So, uh, so if there is a research question that bothers me, then mm -hmm. my immediate way to tackle it is to not find answer on my own, but also yeah. bring these diverse participants together and then find a response from each of them, but also uh, think through that and find a synthesis of what is problem and how could we tackle this problem. So, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Thanks so much for sharing this. It's, such, it's so instructive to hear about the practice of curation and your viewpoints around it because it's, I in, especially in regional um, areas, we have the challenge of having a good curatorial guidance when it comes to exhibitions and also promoters understanding the importance of curation. So uh, I think this is a fantastic little view of what a curator can do and how positive uh, that force can be when we put together things. Um, but coming to the topic at hand and something we've talked about in the past, this this great, I just attended a, a big uh, fair in Bombay called the Festival of Architects and Interior Designers and attended numerous talks there where uh, a lot of the architects were talking about the fact about how um, uh, in the new definitions of luxury, um, handmade and the fact that there is a unique component to spaces uh, has become this new thing in the architectural, architectural world and discussion. Uh, and this is something we've also talked about. There's a revival and interest in artisanal craftsmanship. Um, but if you want to like peel back the layers, what does that term mean to you in the current context and your 
uh, travels in yeah. contemporary art world. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so again, uh, I started noticing this trend uh, very strangely. Earlier it was curated, curated okay. music, curated festivals and all. And suddenly there was a resurgence of artisanal everywhere. Artisanal bags, artisanal bakery, artisanal cheese or whatever. Uh, and especially this was um, pushed by uh, social media a lot. This particular term at this particular forms of uh, making commodities. Which the, um, how back onto a particular past where people were making things with their hand. Oh. And uh, uh, and we need to understand, and, and I think there are two reasons for the resurgence of this is. One is a certain kind of nostalgia for the past, which is again an imagined past, uh, uh, which is also fueled by certain uh, political ideologies that the past was a harmonious past, things were really good uh, and if we lived that way, all this crisis would not have happened. Yeah. So at least let's reclaim certain parts of that past, uh, like again, going back to our, like thinking of organic farming, making things by hand, living with nature and all these ideas that propagate, especially since the ecological crisis and everything, uh, there is this imagination and a strong appeal towards returning to the past. Yeah. And the, the significant problem of that is again too that, that we cannot return to the past. It is not easy. We are strongly advancing to the future day by day and it's not yeah. easy to return to the past. And second, if you are talking about such a past, you also need to understand the conditions, the social conditions of these thoughts. If you are advocating that we should all farm and live and all those things like the older people, like the older generation or the older times we used to do, we have to understand that farming was not practiced by people. Farming was farming was relegated to certain communities of certain castes, and it was imposed on them to do that labor for uh, mostly for free and or what we understand as indentured labor or slave labor because they were lower class they had to perform that for because as part of being of their debt to be born into the lower caste. so all these modes of production which we talk right. about as a specific going back specific history specific social context to it artisan again when we look at these forms of making with a social status attached to and also also very gendered and so when we argue that we have to go back are we reinstating such conditions again we need to really think about it so the yes. fetish of artisanal that is there around us has to be carefully interrogated that why do we have to return to the past why is this past so important for us and so even if you look at the south asian intellectual history the artist, the category of artisan or craftsman is a very complex problem. First of mm -hmm. all, what has happened is that we know all our modern artists, we know all the names of our contemporary artists, but we don't know the name of the artisan or craftsman for making these things. Mm -hmm. That's what we call as the anonymity of the artisan or the craftsman problem in this obsession district. So all the people who made these temples, sculptures, Evil terracotta, the water, the diverse forms of objects that existed around us in the past. Okay. There's no naming, okay. nobody remembers them. And that tradition continues. And this has also again rendered them inferior okay. that these people are not worthy to be remembered, but their labor is important. So, okay. and we will be a nominal amount for their pay. Their Mm -hmm. And that's why these collective terms are used to denote these makers. So they are not individually demoed. Uh, you are right. easily calling crafts, no artisan, and that's easy for you to kind of not like a catch-all phrase. Yes, yes. And um, so this, uh, what you got? This particular problem, the anonymity problem, is a big problem in contemporary art and also in the art historical kind of studies in India. And the second problem is art history as a discipline, which is what um, even the art practitioners study when they go to uh, fine arts departments. 
they prioritize a certain kind of object, the meal for the art, which yeah. is of course painting and sculpture. And when it comes to contemporary art, it's installation, new media, and what all. Mm-hmm. But again, in those domains, again, craft practices, practice of which we call as craft practices, the soft practices, mm-hmm. are considered as inferior. Yeah. Uh, and even practices like embroidery, for that matter, because both of these, uh, to put it very bluntly, are caste based practices, which are practiced mm-hmm. by practice lower caste. And these are also gendered practices, which are also practiced by people. So, all both of these are basically kind of seen as inferior. So that is art history and attitude towards artisan and craft. And the second problem is that the institutional frameworks that are there around us, the municipalities, the academies and all that have been other even the museums, craft museums and all. So yeah. that um, uh, that uh, has a policy level interaction with these practices. They have a very protective and preservationist attitude towards oh, this. Oh. As this craft Practices or artisanal practices have not changed all this well. Right. As if they don't experiment, they don't use new materials, and we need to preserve these practices. Right. So artisans are generally considered as these passive subjects, whereas artists are considered as these active subjects. Yeah. Who yeah. take, who conceptualize, who intervene into the society. But art craftsmen, we have to protect. Them. They don't know anything. They are in this <laughs> and they should make uh, things as they are. And this is this is even the official policy. This is even the this protectionist attitude is the yeah. official attitude of the government of India. And even you yeah. see the difference in ministry at the policy level. The I think the craft practices comes at the Ministry of Textile. And if I ask who yeah. is the Ministry of Textile, nobody will and fine arts and all these modern art and all these practices come in the Ministry of Culture. Yeah. yeah. Which is much more powerful. And the elite in the ministry, which is that. So these are some of the important problems. I think uh, when we are using artists, other we should really uh, uh, think about the history of this practice. And so, right, one artists are not one one yeah, so, one point. One yeah, but this one to add. Even even in the past, when we look at artisanal practices, they are also associated with so, uh, with certain specific social practices. For right. example, artisans were part of guild. So everybody was part of skills if they could have bought it. And there were also domestic practitioners who would just practice from their home or kissing a garbage jacket, they will make things and all. Yeah. Or they were also recognized by devotional associations. Craftsmen right. artisans were working with temples, churches, temples. Or their relation to the caste, their community, and also distinctive gender organizations that was there. So right. artists and identity is also not a fake identity. As societies evolve, as societies kept on changing, the modes yeah. of production change from a pre-industrial society to industrial society. Yeah. These identity lots of shift. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. Yeah, and I think uh, I think you make a very important point that this current fascination that we see with the animated uh, products and um, there is the, uh, I mean, the fact that you're making uh, the point that you're making around social conditions that were inherent and almost implicit in the way uh, items used to be made made in the past and by certain people with certain social backgrounds. Uh, these are very conveniently brushed aside uh, and uh, in some ways our approach even today at a policy level are driven by almost like a paternalistic approach, uh, patriarchal approach towards this entire uh, craft business. But it has in some way captured the imagination of people that somehow uh, if you brush aside these, uh, you know, the social implications of uh, craft production, then uh, it was a golden age. And that's what we should bring back into today's world where we are facing anxiety around ecological challenges and, um, you know, societal disputes and also, uh, you know, br- Somehow it's like a panacea for um, things that we have a hard time um, uh, controlling and blame the mass produced goods on. Now, you have had a chance to work in many festivals, many exhibitions, and you've already noted that craft revival has been a feature in a lot of these. Do you think this is a passing fad or is it something that's going to be a huge part of our lives in the future, this trend that we see 
of uh, uh, interest in the handmade, the handcrafted. What is your take on this uh, from what you've been seeing so far? See, every book has its own nostalgia. Every civilization has its own nostalgia. There is always um, an imagination of a certain kind of past. Um, even for moderns, there was a nostalgia about a certain kind of past. Even for contemporaries, right. there is a certain kind of nostalgia that is informed by their own context, anxieties, and the problems they face. And right. uh, one of the important problems which we also have right now in terms of mythos, not the generally the society, but generally the society is also part of it right now. It's also not escaping. Is the um, what you call the over dominance of the digital that is around us, right. and that's also part of the uh, theme of my next exhibition, which is called "Let's Think That Vanishing Before Us," where yeah. I'm looking at the relevance of objects and what happens to objects when the digital is slowly taking over the physical world. Uh, but in terms of art practice and making, there's an aesthetic divide that is already happening. Uh, uh, the aesthetic divide is basically uh, between the people who still prefer and idealize uh, the ways of making by a hand. And then there is again a large number of artists who prefer this new revolution that is happening in art making that is compounded by the developments in the digital uh, yeah. intelligence sphere, especially artificial yeah. that every And what we need to understand is that um, uh, we cannot abandon both. <laughs> and we need yeah. to also understand the problems of both. And, um, and so this anxiety is also there in the society that we are, we are going to lose things, we are going to lose touch. We have already lost it. We have already lost it and it's not easy to kind of get it back. So these are patchworks. These are like small, what you've got, tapes which we put on packs. So again, getting into artisanal work and all these things, uh, it's not a sincere practice which you see in, uh, which is getting circulated in social media and everything. People are doing it as a hobby. And it was never a hobby historically. It was a life, it was lively. And right. we need to understand. Okay. So, uh, uh, so uh, one of the important problems with exhibitions and all that deal with craft and artisanal practice is that I call them the NGO approach. The NGO approach is only the thing is that it doesn't focus on the aesthetics. It doesn't foreground the artists as thinkers, artists as makers. It only showcases these people as vulnerable, marginalized people, uh, showing a certain kind of pain narrated to gain money out of it and kind of sell the commodity. But it doesn't inform anything about the process and what kind of important interventions these people are making into the practice and why we can also integrate technology, contemporary thinking and all into this field yeah. and open it up. Yeah. And open it up for experiments and for new approaches. So I, I am I'm very skeptical and very scared when it comes to craft practices. And I'm very also very, what we call, very cautionary when it comes to craft practices involving in exhibitions. And one of the last one which I did was in JNU, which was an Indo-UK collaborative project with Savaras University of Sussex, JNU, and different yeah. universities, where we, uh, so it was called as the Great Heritage Project. Right. So, uh, so the important question we were asking is about because art, culture, uh, or memory, all this is part of who we consider uh, like us as. What constitute mm -hmm. our heritage? Who we are? What mm -hmm. are our cultural symbols? What are our monuments? What are the cultural artifacts we cherish and hold on to? And again, when we look at heritage making, we see that again there's a lot of practices that are out of it. Mm -hmm. we, we don't judge that. So even as we look at it, for example, all the craft exhibitions, there are contemporary exhibitions, modern art exhibitions, and there mm -hmm. are craft exhibitions, which also yeah. have a huge market and huge viewership yeah. in, in India. The, and most of them are curated by this guy called Martin Singh. And he is a oh. big kind of an exhibitor. And not now, like previously in the Dahlouin time and well on from that. And there was a reenactment of Martin Singh's exhibition by the VR Foundation, I think mm -hmm. last year or the year before that, which is called as Vishwakarma. Oh. And the um, problem is that 
all indian craftsmen are not hindu and all mm-hmm. indian craftsmen do not believe in the day day vision oh there are in, uh, muslim craftsmen there are christian craftsmen and there are buddhist craftsmen and the, the by way of doing this do you when i say craft practice or in the way i say practice you are in ad meeting lot of crafts that from the right. but mm-hmm. so the problems are many uh, but the recent show which i did um with heritage included many practices um like patachitras but also um my client uh, or ex- uh, indian expatriates in bt who are working mm-hmm. from a domestic sphere uh on to textile and embroidery and it is tech so uh, i just quickly show you the website yeah please i was just about to ask you what would be your approach when you would want to feature craft significant game in one of your exhibitions how would how would you approach it so yeah i think some of the pictures would kind of help us understand uh if there is a differing approach because otherwise it always feels like the craft is playing a second fiddle uh considering the fact that they are like uh a sous chef to the uh, main artist on the exhibition so i think so mayor uh, can you see the website here wait yeah we see yeah. yeah yeah okay so the approach we should have and when we are incorporating craft is that we should not again treat it inferior to contemporary art rather than we should use that as a space where both contemporary and craft practices exist on the same terrain which is also difficult at times but to also make the space even in that way that both of these practices can have a very healthy and active dialogue between each other and that is a space we need to create and understand where craft is not just seen as a practice that is included for a tokenist just well mm-hmm. but it should also say something very strong and it has amazing things to say it has amazing right. things to say about the ecological conditions the gender conditions of india the caste conditions of india and even if you look at aesthetically formally yeah. there is so much in it in terms of shape in terms of color in terms of insertions there is so much that craft practices can do and again a uh, build on a dialogue with contemporary art so the idea so for this exhibition the idea was yeah. to display craft practices along with contemporary art practices as art objects this well and uh, that's what we did um, so we had three sections in this project one was called as craft fair um, uh, the since it was the indo uk project so there were also practitioners from the diasporic context uh, so the craft we looked at uh usually objects that remain outside the canons of national and diasporic narratives and histories so it was also centering around female and lgbtq narratives all uh, right so this is again the section where we used embroidery textiles patachitras and all from because these are also made by mainly by low class on low cost and women and these are also seen in women's work Whoa. So uh, we were looking at uh, these practices. So that there were a lot of uh, practices by craftsmen, but also artists who were also working on embroidery and textiles. Right. So, uh, so, so if you look at this website, I suggest that please go and see the website. So, yep. uh, I did the JNU exhibition, and um, it's called "Let All um, Canaries Be Watching." So um as you can see this so uh, this is Ranjita's work or the framed textile works so and on the on par I just into that but it's just moving so please take a look at it so yep. are this like Shilpa Gupta Dayanita or uh, contemporary artists where placed along with not only again craftsmen but also activists uh Bharat right. Bahujan activists and they were also featuring their interviews their songs and all so all sort of marginal expressions were put together in dialogue with each other to again create a dialogue on what is heritage who belongs to the heritage whose heritage is it and um, how could we also respond to this homogeneity of heritage building that is happening right now by creating building together these different narratives 
So right. this is something which uh, I want to kind of show you that. Yeah. No, yeah, it's pretty. And I think uh, the, the focus on having craft and contemporary practices, having an equal footing and putting it together in a way that they weave that narrative of the fact that this has been uh, a marginalized narrative that needs to be um, brought into focus. Uh, I think that's a very important and a very responsible job for a curator um, or for any curator who's taking a step forward in this direction because otherwise, how else will you change the perception um, of um, if an artisan or a craft is somebody who is or a, or some something that contributes <laughs> in a way that is a lot more uh, positive uh, rather than something that is an afterthought or a curiosity or like oh my god I'm doing something great for the society by supporting the artisan I think you reduce it to um, reduce the value of that to a very uh, minimal level now considering everything that you've talked about and the fact that there is a there is a viewpoint uh, around crafts that um, there's an interest, there's also a homogenization of the narrative, there's a curiosity. Uh, where do you see a path forward? I mean, you've alluded to it in terms of embracing uh, technologies and embracing other things. How do we start, you know, drafting a path? Like in Beats, for example, we've embraced the concept of design thinking as an intervention process when we are talking about designing uh, contemporary takes on craft objects. Um, similarly, I'm sure there are other approaches, but where do you see the convergence of contemporary and craft happening together where we can elevate this to the next level, where we can bring a new kind of dialogue and thinking towards it? What would be your take on it? Okay. Uh, uh, to also respond to an earlier question which you asked, is this all a passing uh, fad? Uh, yeah. uh, uh, I, uh, I don't think so in the sense um, even though this attitude may fade away after some time, but these attitudes will remain. Right now, artisanal may be the trend. Earlier, it was organic farming, collective farming, and all. All these will return. All these are part of our anxieties. And all these are also romanticizing the past without actually understanding the context of the past and how things were conducted in the past. Yeah. So, it will return in different forms, is what I'm saying. Uh, Thinking of a future, the future has to be really interrogated uh, if you are really serious about thinking of all of this together. is mainly, first of all, to reconfigure our teaching itself. And I Great. think that's very important. And also generally education itself. So because education again creates this uh, idea, the art craft binary, that when we again talk of art, the object of being appears as painting structures and art. And when we talk of craft, this, this kind of vocational things start appearing in our mind. Yeah. And we need yeah. to change that. And there are only few institutes that have successfully done it for some time, like Shanti Nikhil has started doing it for some time. But again, those hierarchies started coming uh, at yeah. a later stage. Uh, so the idea is to integrate what I call as not art and craft, but making. And making, whether it is painting, whether it is sculpting, whether it is pottery, whatever, all of this involves making and the making of an object or an image. And that is where you need to give importance to the practice of making, which we have not as a society given importance to. So making has always been undermined. And that's the problem of the dominant intellectual tradition of our society, which prioritizes knowledge debate, discourses, over making, over people who actually work with hand. And that's because people who work with hand are also considered as inferior and lower in society and in social status. So we need to rethink a history of making, that who were the makers, how were they making, and that has to be introduced into the curriculum. And instead of normal pleasuring or categorizing these practices as this is our this yeah. aircraft, this is artisan and work. We need to erase all that and only yeah. focus on the art of making. That right. you are making this particular thing. And whether it is utilitarian or not utilitarian, that's a different thing. Yeah. You can yeah. create the design is always utilitarian. Art is yeah. not utilitarian. 
Exactly. And yeah. that is up to you. But we need to strongly infuse in our curriculum the pedagogy of making, which is really missing all our obviousness. So that's about the teaching part. What else do you think uh, would help this uh, uh, this process of uh, integration of craft uh, as uh, something that we value and cherish and um, think of it in, on almost like another equal footing when it comes to contemporary art or any of the other practices that we're saying? What else can we do besides um, improving the teaching? That we are there. Any policy directives, any commercial angles that comes to your mind based on the conversations and festivals you've seen? See, uh, again, uh, even in terms of advocacy, policy making, and also exhibition making, uh, we need different strategies. But one unified strategy which we all need is to put all these things on the same plate, on the same terrain. That one and and this also have seen in various exhibitions where contemporary artists go to artisans mm-hmm. and they tell them what to do. There's no right. interaction, no equality there. And uh, since the craftsmen are supposed to uh, illustrate their point, right? And there could be interesting interactions. And this does right. not happen because the attitude framed by the policy, as I said. Is that artisans are traditional, they are innocent, their practice is frozen from time immemorial, it has not changed. But right. if you look at all the, even if you look at the, uh, like all the practitioners of miniature and other forms of things, they all use synthetic materials. Cool. They are using new like synthetic materials and all, and they, are, they use notes, but they say that they are the handicraft and all, but all of them are using machines and all, you know, to increase production, productivity yep. and everything. Yep. So we need to bring the art, craft, and all these soft practices into the same terrain and put them in dialogue with each other and right. abandon protectionist right. attitude, a lively right. oriented attitude towards craft and artisanship, and for okay. around the aesthetic and design importance of all okay. these practices. And how does it matter to have these things in our everyday life? What does it do? Right. And how is it different from having a plastic cup and this particular form of cup? And it's not only right. because it's good for ecology, but there should be something different in terms of design, in terms right. of durability, and in terms right. of its beauty, what it can do to your life, what it can right. do to your thinking, and what it can do to your mind. And right. that is what we need to have. And the more we try to build on a pity narrative that these people are losing their job, these people yeah. are you know, Extinguished practices, extinct, getting extinct, and all that, it's not going to help. Yeah. We need to strongly uh, kind of enter into all these domains together, into pedagogy, into exhibition, into policy making. Uh, That is what uh, I love for an overall holistic approach can only solve this issue. Yeah. And I think stress on uh, the nature of collaboration between contemporary artists and and um, and craft practitioners, that nature of collaboration has to be redefined along with the give and take. Uh, from a policy level, there also needs to be a, um, a stimulant that is less of a livelihood focus, but more focused around uh, building an ecosystem where craft can thrive. And uh, I'm saying it was just with creativity. Yeah, ecosystem of creativity. Uh, supported by, uh, you know, perception from at a young age, like I always feel that you know we have um, we have flawed role models uh, or uh, a limited supply of role models when we are looking at our society in general. Like for a craft person, who does he look up to as a superstar? Who does uh, he or she think is uh, uh, someone that they can aspire to become? Right? Uh, if if they continue in this practice, so he, you know reevaluating those paradigms and bringing a new viewpoint and new role models and new um uh people in into this into this discussion i think that's also very important because otherwise with the existing uh discussion around just pure livelihood this is never going to go anywhere um thank you so much Pranjish. i think i want to give thank you a few minutes to uh the people in the audience to ask questions this has been a very rich discussion i think we've barely scratched the surface and obviously we can talk 
for yeah, us. Yeah. But uh, but like in this in this 45 minutes that you guys have heard, I'm sure there must be thoughts in your mind around what you uh, perceive around arts and crafts uh, and uh, the resurgence and interest. So if you have any questions, you have Premjesh here who can uh, who can answer some of these questions. So please, I open the floor the next five minutes to please ask questions on this. Do we have any questions in the uh, text box at all? I don't see any. No, just down. There's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone with questions? I, I, I might have one question if uh, nobody else has any, but I'll, I'll wait for a second. Okay. Now, so, Fringish, there's another thing which you also talked about when we were talking about uh, the craft movement was, uh, which I found quite interesting, which is your perception of uh, the Gandhian ideal around craft movement. And uh, yeah. uh, anybody who's worked in uh, any field of crafts would always talk about the Seva Gram. And uh, like for us in Ceramics, when we've been working, there's been a huge movement of people who have worked in Seva, Seva Gram and have gone on to form ceramic schools. Uh, and I've uh, involved local potters and worked with them. Uh, but you made an allusion towards uh, the Gandhian thought around the crop movement, uh, which I thought was quite interesting. Would you uh, elaborate on my sharing it with the group here? Um, so, yeah, so when I earlier said that uh, the protectionist attitude that the ministry has uh, is actually fueled by the Gandhian imagination of handicraft. Uh, that right. has you know, that has been idealized by Gandhi, uh, which yes. is also very problematic for me, because um, again, as I was saying, that all of the people who were creating uh, at that particular time who were the artisans, who were the craftsmen, and they were saying, in the garden, the Gandhian ideal world, the village system is the perfect system, where right. uh, people are making things with their own hand and everything, and everybody is dependent on each other for things and everything. And that's right. not exactly how society and the social geography of that time worked. Okay. The social geography was clearly distributed, caste-based, uh, the land, the where people stayed, and everything was segregated in that particular right. order. And even if you look at all the important Shaiba Shatsplats, Manuswati, and all those stats, even Manuswati is uh, very important in that case because it is about all the people who work in Mm -hmm. So we're starting from like dark and little sugar making, salt, salt making, physician, but all the speed people who watch it towns. There are much people who call them much carve yogis, people who have their hat on their livelihood. Uh, and it is compared, it's like uh, that particular uh, uh, occupation uh, has been assigned to the fourth Varna, the Shudra, not to anybody else about. So you can see that how in the ancient society, uh, especially in the village society, these activities were considered as. And what were the status of these artisans of craftsmen in that particular society? And again, if you look at crafts, like even if you look at Vishwakarma community, like there are five sub castes. Mm -hmm. And even uh, there is not clear interaction between the five sub castes, they don't intermarry with each other. So if that is the situation of one caste and the sub caste, like imagine the kind of conflict and separation that is there with other castes. Definitely people dependent on each other for the one sort of objects and everything. But ancient society was not ordered in the modern economic terms, in terms of labor and the rewards for labor, or the payments for labor. Many right. times labor is also considered as something that has to be given for free, that has to be done for the upper class and all. So Gandhi started idealizing this village society and also things that had to be made by what he called hand. And this was a big problem that also uh, led to the formation of the craft policies in right. uh, what he did. Uh, and one of the important person who did this is um, Devi Prasad, a porter who was in parents by Gandhi uh, and also conducted Nayi Dalim. Uh, which is influenced by Gandhi yep. education. Yeah. So, the, so this policy is very problematic. That way. I think Shumantra yep. has it. Yeah, I think Shumantra has a question. Please, Shumantra, go ahead. 
Ada yang orang yang dia big time uh, fringe. It's a lovely subject and, and 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 a very important subject, I must say. Uh, now this till now, I could say what I see in my life. This hierarchy is more to, if I may use the term, sociological term, material condition and post-material condition. Uh, for example, uh, India's condition is a very material condition, but still we roti ka pramakan tight economic and things like that. But if you go, go to Europe or USA or other places where post-materiality is much better, that means at least 80% has uh, got their food, shelter and air. There, Coming back to my thing in India, most of the craftsmen does craft for their livelihood. That means for food. Uh, to earn money, that means going to the workshop 10 o'clock and constantly sit in the thing from 10 to 5 and then go back home. Most of them I have seen that. Uh, and uh, so, I consider in their psychological or neurological set of a brain, they don't want, in a sense, recognition, in a sense, a kind of, the kind of, yeah, I must say recognition or individualism, ideas or these kind of things, uh, because economic condition doesn't allow it. Uh, whereas, whereas, for example, my as a privileged person, I will constantly think of this kind of things: the recognition, ideas, uh, of this kind of the things. So, art suits me more than crafts, if I may make the binary of this. Uh, so, in this kind of condition, if I am right at all, what I am analyzing this condition in India, uh, how you make a holistic approach to art and craft, design and everything together. Kind of things. In fact, why don't you leave craft on a craft sense? So, what, what, what is the necessity of making this holistic approach in one singular Hot. Yeah. I said, um, again, it's a complex answer and framing. Uh, but again, with time, this should out try to answer as much as possible. The one thing is that um, the problem which you listed in the beginning, that uh, it's related to conditioning. It's an ideological conditioning. And the ideological conditioning is a what Nastasta that you have been told that you have to perform the task without getting any recognition. And that's a problem, without getting any reward. And that is what, even if you take away caste or anything, that's what is expected from Dalits, that you have to list the excreta. Because you are born onto that caste, you are not supposed to get any reward or anything. So every social status and every social form of labor has been inscribed to the Indian social system in such a way, especially when it comes to these inferior forms of labor, that you are not expected to claim any kind of recognition and reward for. And the very few people, again, if you look at the social status and payment methods and everything that existed in the pre-colonial, in the pre-industrial times, uh, there were different forms of payment that existed. So even if you look at temple societies, temple societies paid the upper caste by giving them land and access to the temple. Uh, and they were also given like occasional bonuses or whatever. And all these lower uh, sort of works uh, were paid via what you call cash. That's the very normal amount. And it was disposed. Whereas the others enjoyed, they were landed. How did they become landed? That would be a princess can the cup. They were granted lands, whereas others were not granted lands. They were pushed out to the territories to live there. So this is conditional. 
So just because centuries of conditioning like this has trained them to be like that, doesn't mean that we should accept that. Our model, that, that's an important distinction which happened in modernity is that we started appreciated, appreciating making and makers as something really unique. But the problem with modern art in India was that it also got hijacked by these, uh, all these people from the upper class and upper caste and all who entered into the early art education institutions uh, in order to become artists. Uh, because if you look at the history of all the government art colleges, most of the government art colleges started as industrial uh, center, uh, like what you call it. They were teaching basically industrial arts, they were, which means they were teaching craft practices and uh, artisan practices. They were not teaching art. But an important shift happened where fine arts was taught. And, but why can't these people claim to be artists? is one of the important questions. And there are various attempts that have been done by scholars. For example, Jyotindra Jain called them as modern masters, a different term which he uses to denote these forms of practices. Uh, and the Bonner calls these practices what is called vernacular practice. If contemporary art is the cosmopolitan practice, modern art is the cosmopolitan practice. This is sort of vernacular practice. And she has done an exhibition again with the Viad Foundation period that we, we need to have a wide range of craftsmen into contemporary arts. So people are doing that. My suggestion is that if you look at pedagogy, which you have asked me finally, I'm not interested in bringing craft, bringing art, bringing all this thing. I am interested in bringing making, the practice of making, and the practice of thinking for making. And that form of making is expanded. That includes everything. That includes painting, that includes weaving, that includes pottery, all forms of peace making. And we need to kind of uh, remove all the social conditions that are put onto them. And as I said, has to be put on the same terrain as equivalent to each other. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I understand. I understand. Well, I just, I just ask this because uh, um, this question is coming in my mind, and of course, in my no, I know because we uh, in SNU like we were thinking of that lab. Yeah, if you remember, we were thinking of that lab, and when we like again, when labs are constructed in contemporary art departments, it's mainly again of workshops, tools, and modern technology and everything. But rather than that, we were again making a make things of making a lab of making. Where all these different forms of practices come together, and Shivanta and I were also part of this discussion at that time, which yeah. did not happen. Yes, it didn't happen. But no, I've, my, my, my uh, this another point. I don't know whether I'm correct. Uh, I'm seeing in my own personal art practice, uh, in terms of skill, there are lots of this uh, craft. Uh, uh, artisans skills are coming into my typical modern uh, contemporary art painting you may say also if i may use the word folk the element of folk is, is coming into that that's so that's very interesting there that the way i'm handling an object or an animal or a tree or things as a uh, making me Uska crafts making ke saath ek ye hai. Wo, wo mein, wo mein, mein bahut soch ke nahi kiya. But so, for example, swing, katha uh, stitch. Ye jo ek kala hai, Bengal mein bahut ye hai. And I'm doing it with my brush, no doubt about it. But the whole thing is, uh, the whole idea came of this detailed, small, small things or integrated things coming from, you'll be very surprised to know, it is coming from after COVID. I realized uh, the whole thing is, the whole truth is very small, very small. One drop of whatever can actually destroy the planet. For example, the COVID. Um, उसका जो जार्म है ये बहुत छोटा चीज है 
तो वो एक वो एक वो एक रियलाइजेशन था मेरे लिए दैट हाउ टू मेक स्मॉल स्मॉल थिंग्स उसमें ज्यादा वो स्मॉल थिंग्स में ज्यादा ट्रूथ है वो एक वो एक सोच है उससे उससे ये ये जो पोस्ट इंडस्ट्रियलेशन के बाद बिगनेस बिग 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 का जो एक माहौल था मॉडर्निज्म में बहुत था वो मॉडर्न माहौल एंड यू वांटेड टू बी बिग बट देन यू रियलाइज द ट्रूथ रिमेन्स इन वेरी स्मॉल थिंग Yeah, I think we've got yeah. one more question from Rajesh. Uh, shouldn't be the art institutions advocating policies for craft practices today, considering the shift that's happened to art. Is there a scope <laughs> where art institutions can advocate policies regionally? Mm. Yeah, thank you, Rajesh. And Shubham, so thank you for that question. Thank you. Yeah, it's a complicated um, discussion. Uh, we will continue that again but then the end of the week too uh a modern one important one like just one few seconds to just respond to that is that one of the important problems of again modernism uh though even it is a critique of modernity which is the industrialization the larger imperial uh, expansion of capital and everything but still it was also fascinated by machines it was also fascinated by modern technologies to some extent like even if you look at which we are some all the practitioners and today i was looking at actually for a lecture the data institute of american research and how that again especially and rahobi baba how that played an important role in building modern indian collection uh i did not collection but again uh, baba did not collect it draft practice or anything for that but even the artists who are making those big murals and all for TIS for the fundamental data institute then where moving along with the narrative that was set by the official narrative of the narrow in India and they were creating that history that civilizational narrative for that and craft was never seen they never thought that we could bring in craftsmen or artisans to bring in these civilization civilization narratives uh, and one important thing is, uh, with what other deeds does it's important great book tradition so even if Hussain and all goes back at Indian walls and goddesses iconography and everything but there is also significant break for them from tradition which is also influenced by European modern is that way so that's why even for Dominion and Tagore and all these people uh, what you got uh, for them uh, they were really dismissive of craft practices uh but and they were also discuss uh dismissive of mobile variations and all this uh so it's a very complicated terrain we are looking at so if to answer rajesh's question the problem with policy making and the majority of institutions that operate at the level of craft is that they are public institutions most of them unlike contemporary arts we have we which is like filled with these networks of different kind of institutions private galleries museums auction houses and all and universities and all those things which teach contemporary art exclusively which offer degrees and all we don't have such kind of wider fostered like healthy ecosystem for uh craft practices the policy decisions are made by people who are basically as you know like after giving back and all that these are bureaucrats who have no basically who have an interest who may have interest in and there i'm not discussing bureaucrats because uh like there have been important bureaucrats who were also what you call played an important role in collecting the uh, miniatures and building collection writing art history documenting these practices and all they have done that but most bureaucrats are tied they have limited understanding of what practices and they also have their own prejudices and that reflects in policy and the policy for example what is the biggest achievement for a cross that the cross plus of the best that is the 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 what is that mom the master award no? the master craftsman that's the award which a person gets and and these are old redundant ideas of what cross plus means uh, who is the master who is not a master because master means you are again kind of 
inscribing a Guru Shishya tradition. And instead of looking at a horizontal way of disseminating knowledge, you're again kind of reinstating that hierarchy of Guru Shishya Parampara and everything. So it's very difficult for a modern democratic way of thinking to infuse into the craft practice because the policy level itself stops them. And that's a big problem because we have this idea that craft is traditional, craft has to protect it. And it's very difficult to change that. And there have been many people who have tried to change that through exhibitions, trying to work with government and all. But in the absence of parallel ecosystems, we need. So we need regular exhibitions, like what you guys are doing, residencies for these people, bringing them in dialogue with contemporary artists and designers and all these things. So it should not only happen in Bangladesh, it should happen across the country. But that's not happening. Even Kerala government has now um, uh, allowed the funding for 24 museums, which means like uh, like every district should have a museum. But none of these museums are going to be for craft practice than all. Like, but again, as you know, Kerala has a rich diversity of craft practice than all. And every news, uh, like every time I hear Vishwakarma goes based the carpet, just fighting for even basic rights, minimum wages, they don't have welfare schemes and all. And government dismisses that each time. So there is this dismissive, inferiorizing, infantilizing attitude towards Kerala. And that's where, as I said, we need to consider meeting and push making as an important part of our curriculum, our life, that we all need to learn to make. Well, what are it? It will from smart people. We, we should learn to make. I think uh, there are a few more questions, but I think I'll have to cut it short considering that we have taken plenty of time. And I think it was a very invigorating and uh, rich discussion. I think one of the biggest things that all of us can take away is our perception of making, the perception of what we would consider as creation and objects and what uh, what uh, you know traditional knowledge is delineated between art and craft. We should question that paradigm. And I think it will make us richer in terms of our lifestyles and our choices. Thank you so much, Premjish, for this absolutely invigorating talk. And thank you everyone for attending and staying for such a long conversation. Um, this yes. entire video will be available on YouTube, so you can share it and uh, uh, and watch it at your leisure if you have further thoughts on the topic. And as usual, we'll be back again with another topic uh, with the Art Design Conversation Series. We'll be exploring more of this in the future, so do stay tuned. And once again, Premjish, thank you so much. Join us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you, Bekia. Thank you, Team Reads. And also, thanks to all the friends from Bogodesha and other friends also. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Good night.